So first, some introduction. Uh, my name is Laurent Picard. As you can hear, uh, I'm French. Uh, I live in Paris. Uh, I'm a developer advocate. Um, I've, I've been working uh, with Google for two years now. I'm focusing on cloud technologies. And in a previous life, uh, I was an ebook pioneer. So that was in the previous century, 1999. Uh, I was one of the first makers of the first ebook device. Uh, it was a big brick of one kilogram, like a big iPad at the time. Okay? So as you can guess, I've been uh, doing a lot of embedded software development. And eventually, the devices got connected with Wi-Fi. And so I came to work on cloud technologies. And when with cloud technologies also, machine learning is not that far. And I have a scientific background. So it happens that I'm now also focusing on Python, which is great. OK, but uh, let's know a little bit more about you. Who is a developer in the audience? Raise your hand. Yeah, three, uh, about 75%. Um, do we have uh, machine learning experts, data scientists, machine learning researchers? OK, OK, I'm not. So I'm not an expert. So if I say something wrong, please correct me, OK? Uh, do we have people using machine learning solutions, services, anything? OK, so you, you might know a little bit about what we're going to see. And do we have cloud users already? OK, 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 great. So let's get started. Um, I'd I, I very much like to start with this quotation uh, from uh, Arthur C. Clarke. Um, because w when I see something new with machine learning, very often I feel magic, right? And I have a, some idea about how it works, but very often, you see something new, and it feels like magic. So today, with you, I hope to scratch a little bit and just show you that this is technology. My goal today is to show you what you can do as a developer without being an expert, OK? Um, so today, tomorrow, yesterday, uh, it's conference days, right? Uh, this is human learning. You are going to see a lot of slides, hopefully not too many bullet points. You are going to see many examples. That's human learning. And out of that, you are going to get information, right? So machine learning is exactly the same. Somewhere you have data. So this is a project I'm working on. Hopefully, uh, I will write an article in a few months. But from this data, the goal is to get information. And that's the, the core of machine learning. How does it work? So the experts have been trying to mimic the way we think our brain works with neural networks with synapses, right? For that, we are using, they are using a lot of samples. So those are examples, real life examples, exactly like uh, I learned uh, from my parents when I was a kid. I learned by watching them doing stuff. And the result is surprising, is magic. We managed to solve problems with machine learning, problems that we couldn't solve um, any, any way else before that. Uh, it works. We solve problems. Maybe the issue today is that we are not able to explain why it works or why we get these results. But for the timing, the cool, the cool thing, the magic thing is that we are able to solve problems. Okay. An example for, for those uh, who have not seen a neural network. So here, for instance, this would be the training phase. So an expert would use if you want to, to differentiate cats and dogs, would use many pictures of cats and dogs and would tell the, re the expected result. And they would build a neural network, they would train it, and they would have connections. Once it's done, so that, that's the training phase, then you can use the neural network to make predictions. And you can give a new input to the model, and the model will, will make a prediction. So for instance, here it will tell you Oh, I think this is a dog in this picture, and I am 87% 87 sure about it. OK? To give you an idea about how important that is at Google, those are the number of projects that include a machine learning model at Google. And as you can see, for a few years, this has been exponential. You can see that in some uh, applications, some solutions. Uh, Gmail, for instance, when you type uh, a sentence, uh, sometimes uh, after a couple of words, we propose you to end the sentence. And oh, sometimes it's, the sentence is even better than what I want you to write. Uh, also, sometimes uh, you can do a quick answer to an email. You have three suggestions, right? 
are very short, but sometimes it's work, it works pretty well and saves time. And so machine learning is going, going to be omnipresent uh, because this is solving so many problems, uh, saving time. Uh, you can expect that uh, in almost er everything. Okay, so if we step back a little bit, as of today, there are three ways we can benefit from machine learning if we're working in technology. Either you are an expert, so there are a few here, uh, and experts have been working on AI, machine learning, deep learning for decades. Uh, I've met people who have been working for 30 years on, on machine learning or on AI. Uh, machine learning is more recent. Uh, and this is a field that we benefit from. So AI is, let's say, roughly 70 years now. We benefit from theory about AI, from a lot of different experiences, algorithms, neural networks. So there's a lot of theory, but for since a few years, let's say since 10 years, now we have the computing power. So theory and computing power works now. Even our smartphones now are able to train a model or to make a prediction with a model. Right. So if you are an expert, you know uh, how it works, and this is where innovation is coming from. Experts now can build smarter solutions, uh, real innovative solutions. But if we are developers and have no knowledge in AI, we can actually use ready-to-use models with machine learning APIs. So an API is something that you can call from a browser, for instance, in JavaScript. So you make a request and you will get a JSON uh, stream back with the results. So this is the easiest solution, something that you can do in a couple of hours in your own solution. So I will talk about that today uh, quickly uh, with many examples to give you an overview of everything you can do. And I will also show you a new technique that appeared less than, a bit over one year ago. Those are AutoML techniques. So with the machine learning APIs, you are able to use something that is ready to use, right? That will give you generic results. In some cases, these results will not be enough for, for your use case. You will want more precise results. And this is where AutoML will help you. So I'm going to show you these two uh, cases that any developer can use, okay? So first, the machine learning APIs. We call them building blocks. So building blocks are like Lego bricks. You can take one brick and integrate it into your solution. So as I said, they are ready to use machine learning models. Or oh, of course, um, I'm using um, solution, I'm describing solutions from Google Cloud Platform, but uh, keep in mind that those are generic principles. So if you are working with another cloud provider, so Amazon, uh, Microsoft, Azure, uh, IBM, they all have um, AI solutions, right? And also there are many, many uh, dedicated companies working on machine learning solutions. So I'm just illustrating my, my purpose today with Google Cloud because this is uh, the solutions that I know most. So this is our family of machine learning APIs today. As input, you can give text, pictures, videos, audio, especially speech. And as a result, you get information. And in some cases, you get the input that is transformed. For instance, translation, speech to text, or text to speech. Okay. So I'm going to show you a few examples. I start uh, with the Vision API because uh, this is really my favorite API for personal reasons. When I was a student, um, I learned how to detect edges in pictures, right? So at the, in the 90s, we were trying to detect edges in pictures, and from the edges, we were trying to detect objects. So it kind of worked, but it was very limited. Uh, as soon as you used a new picture, it wouldn't work anymore or badly. Uh, so that was not the, the right solution. And machine learning here for me is magic because it solves all, all, the, all the problems. Okay, so for instance, I'm from Paris. If I take this picture, the Vision API will tell me that this is about Paris. You have the JSON uh, stream uh, response on the left, on the right, sorry. Uh, so yeah, this is about Paris. There's an Eiffel Tower. The, the API takes less than a second, must be something like 600 or between 600 and 800 milliseconds to answer. 
that's the time I, t I take to process this picture myself. Yeah, this is Paris, this is the Eiffel Tower. Everybody here, I, I guess, would say the same in less than a second. So no big deal. You can notice that it's able to detect the, uh, the Paris location and giving me the GPS location of this place. So I took a different picture with also an Eiffel Tower, but here, if I just have a, a look at it, in less than a second, I, I know it's not Paris. It's actually Las Vegas. So this is the Paris Hotel uh, and Casino in, in Las Vegas, where they've, they've been putting a um, smaller scale uh, Eiffel Tower, but still quite big. The API here is not full. It's able to recognize uh, the, the location too. And also where I use this picture from, okay? Even though uh, I change the picture every time, okay? It's not exactly the original picture. So I try to, to see the limit of a vision model. So this time I use another picture, but I flipped it, I skewed it a little bit, I zoomed in and I cropped it. So there's no way you can find yourself this picture on the web unless you have a lot of time. And here, someone like me in less than a second would say, yeah, yeah, this is Paris. This is the Eiffel Tower in Paris. But actually this is this, the Eiffel Tower in Las Vegas. And the vision model here is not fooled. It's able to tell me that this is uh, Las Vegas. And maybe if I think about it for a few seconds, yeah, yeah, that's correct here. There's nothing below the actual Eiffel Tower in Paris. Okay, so this is the limit where a machine learning model can be more efficient than us. Most of the time we're better, of course, for the time being, hopefully. <laughs> okay, so now for the rest, um, I'm going to use um, examples from Tolkien Universe. Let's say it's a tribute uh, to Tolkien. So this is a picture this time uh, from New Zealand. This is uh, the movie set of Lord of the Rings. So they kept the villages and so on. This is called Obiton. If I give this picture to the vision model, it's able to tell me that there are three objects detected. A plant, a window, and a house. Uh, actually, the window here is rather a door, but let's say it's a window for a, a hobbit, right? Uh, as you can see in the, in the result, I have a, an ID, a name, and a score. So that's the, the confidence I, I can have in, in the model, in the results. If I take a similar picture from Hobbiton, um, it's also able to give me labels, so to describe me the picture. So here, this is about nature, a tree, it's a photography, there's sky, grass, so everything is correct. But additionally, it's able to tell me that there's a, a text, a block of text here in English. The font is a little bit fancy, it's not elfish, but it's not a usual font either. Um, and so the result here is pretty good. There are stresses on some vowels, so for a computer, it's pretty new. There's only one mistake here. Uh, it's missing a space between except and all. But the kerning actually is a bit bad, so that's why it's making the mistake. Here, we are auto-correcting this. Uh, we are able to read that without any problem. But a few months ago, there were, there were two mistakes in the detection. So what's cool with machine learning models is that they are constantly learning Whenever you provide new samples, they will improve the model and they will learn something new and they will correct mistakes. So this is what I could discover over maybe four months. I had two mistakes four months ago and uh, last month, uh, five months ago and last month, uh, only one mistake. So maybe in a few months, it will be perfect. If there are faces in the picture, it's, it's able to tell you the location of the faces, the location of the eyes, the nose, and everything. It's able to tell you uh, the position of the face in 3D. It's also able to recognize sentiments in the face. So here, this is a 3D rendition of Gollum, and it's telling me, okay, that this face may be angry, and this is Gollum, and Gollum is always angry, so this is, this is also correct. If there is something of someone famous in the picture, uh, it will try to detect it too. So here, this is a very rare picture of Tolkien in a forest taken uh, for a Spanish newspaper. And 
the vision model is able to tell me that this picture is about Tolkien, which I, I find amazing. Okay, so of course it's using the context of the picture and the article to tell me that. And as you can see, so it's telling me that this is about Tolkien, and I also have an ID identifier for Tolkien. So I can use this ID in all APIs to, to know that I'm talking about Tolkien. Tolkien the father and not the son. The son would have a different ID. Okay. And the, in the results here, I have the source image that I used. I also have uh, visually similar images. So it means if I browse the results, I will find persons in a forest or persons against a tree in the results. It can be useful in some cases. So this is an API. So you can call the API directly, but also most often you will find client libraries in, the, in your favorite language. So here's a Python example. It always works the same. You create a client, you provide the content, and you call the feature that you want. So here it's face detection, for instance. And then in less than a second, you have the results that, that you can process immediately. Okay. But more than slides, let's try a live demo with local examples, okay? So I've taken pictures yesterday evening. Let's try to see what uh, the model tells me. So here, this, you can try it in a browser. Uh, so I will just drag and drop the picture. So this one is a very bad picture that I took from a taxi yesterday evening. Very bad one, you can see the window of the taxi. I was surprised. I, I didn't think it would work, honestly. It's able to tell me that this is the Bratislava Castle. And of course, I always remove the metadata from the, the, the pictures because you know um, um, uh, the cameras, they are recording the GPS location most often, especially on your phones. So I always remove it just to be sure. It's not used by default anyway. You can if you want to improve the result, you can, you can say, please use the metadata, but by default it's not used and anyway remove that. So here it's able to recognize the Bratislava castle. To be fully, so it's not very sure about it, but it's amazing that it's been able to find that from other similar pictures, okay? It's not a nice picture. Uh, to be fully transparent, uh, I've, I've taken two pictures uh, in the taxi, and the second one is not recognized like, like this one. So you see it's not, it's not perfect, but, but still, in this case, this is amazing. So let's try something else. So this one you might recognize is from the city center. So this, this time, I was a bit disappointed. It's not telling me that this is Bratislava. So maybe my picture is not... Okay, so also a bad picture, it's not the, the, the right angle, I should have taken it. But so it's not detecting Bratislava, but it's telling me that it's, there's a floor, a road surface, cobblestones, there's metal and maybe art, which is correct, okay? Um, maybe it could tell me this is a sculpture or, or so on. So maybe in a few months it will tell me the, the actual name and location of, of this, right? So let's try with another picture I took right away after that. And here, I didn't think it would work, but this is actually a picture that, this is a, apparently a very famous location. And it's able to tell me exactly where it is. Um, I checked, um, actually, a similar picture uh, was taken for, for a tour agency um, in Bratislava. And if you check the labels, so yeah, this is the night. Uh, this is about a building, architecture, maybe a church, which is, it's a basilica maybe, or a church. Yeah, so a cathedral, yeah, you see, uh, everything can be used. So let's keep that. I didn't have the time. So let's try this picture. So this is a picture I found on the web. I zoomed in and cropped it. I changed the color so there's nothing in common um, uh, with anything. Uh, so here, uh, it's telling me that there's a face that is very likely uh, joyful, which is, yeah, correct. In the labels, um, so those are pretty generic labels. 
lady, uh, beauty, smile, long hair, yeah, everything is correct. Um, I tried with your prime minister, and I always have the same result. It's telling me, for all politicians, male politicians, it's telling me that it's a businessman, okay? <laughs> because they are wearing suits and often ties, okay? So here I'm happy to not have a businesswoman, but something very positive. And if I check the, uh, the web entities, it's actually telling me that this, this might be, it's not sure, this might be Susanna uh, Chaputova. Uh, it's related to Slovakia, and maybe she's running for the president, presidential election, uh, which I think is, is correct, okay? So I, fi I find that amazing. You can get a lot of insights uh, from pictures, okay? So I did a little demo for you to participate, okay? Let's try to do so something all together. So please get your smartphones or, or um, laptops connected. So what I did, I used uh, cloud technologies. So this is a serverless architecture. Um, on the right side, I'm using buckets. So those are folders in the cloud. I'm just using three Python functions here. And whenever you're going to upload a selfie, it's going to call this function, which is very simple. It's going to use to call the Vision API. I will store the result here. And with the picture and the results, I'm going to do some composition. And it will trigger a second and third function. OK? Uh, and then you will see the result on your smartphone. So let's try that. I call this demo stash club. So if you remember Fight Club, there are eight rules, but here there's only one. If it's your first time at stash club, you must get your stash, your mustache, okay? So let's try this. Uh, so you can get connected by using this QR code, okay? Or you can type bit.ly slash pycon sk19. So I give you a moment to get connected. Yeah. PyCon SK19. Okay, and you should reach a page like that. So it's, if you're late, uh, you can still type the URL. It's here, you can see it, yeah, bit.ly slash PyCon SK. So let's move to uh, the first uh, step. You can refresh the page, you enter your nickname, then you say that you're okay with the camera, uh, to be taking a picture. Uh, if you're not supposed to be here, uh, maybe don't do it. Uh, <laughs> you might see your face on the screen or maybe on the web uh, if you tweet it uh, later, but I think it's live too, so okay. Uh, so you can try to take a selfie and try to express an emotion. So you try to be happy, surprised, hungry, uh, and sad, okay? Uh, so let's... Don't make fun of me, okay? But try it yourself. So you see, it's working. It's telling me that I, I look surprised. And so I'm adding a mustache to everyone. As you know, I, I'm able to know the location of the nose, the mouse, the eyes and everything. So I'm using the mouse and the nose to place a mustache. Let's try something else. And by the way, I look like my father with a mustache. Yeah, so... <laughs> So you see it's able to detect joy here. So let's see what you've been doing. Do we have angry people? Yes. <laughs> Do we have sad people? Oh, I'm sorry. I hope it's not a presentation. Surprise people? Yeah, it works. And happy people? Cool, so thank you. I love happy people. And of course, um, you have to take into account other cases where it's different. So, okay, so here, it's here, maybe you're a little bit angry. <laughs> okay, and also, so this is a server solution. So, if we were 1000 here, it will scale up automatically. So, that's what, what I love with serverless. Um, let me invite a few guests. So. So here, this is the first bucket. So those are your selfies. And if I invite a few more people, I just drag and drop. Okay. 
And okay, see, so this is me. And let's check. So I have my president, maybe your next president. 50% chances, let's say, or some other uh, politicians. Uh, here, there's a zombie. So <laughs> if you remember, um, I can know the type of picture I have, uh, whether it's a violent picture. Here, the zombie is likely to be violent, so I blurred it on the, on the fly. Okay, so also this is something that can be useful to filter content. Uh, so here, Wolverine, who is angry, and okay, okay, so you see, it works, it's fast, it works, pre it's not perfect, you have to be careful, but it's pretty fun and, and efficient. Okay, so that was your live demo. So you've seen with pictures and you can imagine a lot from that and extrapolate, and especially to video. So with video, it's about the same. So it's a little, little bit late, it was done after, so you have new features on videos, but you can extrapolate uh, everything you've seen on pictures uh, with videos. But of course, with vi videos, you have one more dimension, which is time. So with videos, you can actually detect the different sequences. <laughs> so it's easier to show you an example. So I didn't do it in my demo. But, so this is a video that was indexed actually with the Video Intelligence API. And you have the labels here. And so for instance, it's telling me that there's a spiral galaxy at the beginning of the video. The world is made with... Which is correct. Uh, there are humans. Particular, yes. you can be enormous. Yes. You learn to code, you and in so doing. Okay, that is correct. Oh, and I spoiled the next one. And there's a polar bear. You will fix something or change something. So you see, maybe you have dozens of hours of videos. And so you can index them and may maybe find results without having to uh, look at them all. Okay. So now uh, about text. So this is a field, especially with Pythonistas, uh, that is very famous. It's called NLP, Natural Language Processing. There are libraries uh, in Python. Um, but you can use also uh, cloud APIs. Um, and with a natural language model, um, what you can do is analyze the text. So you can first get the syntax. So it used to be uh, done by grammaticians, right, with engines. So here, with machine learning, you can actually uh, process more sentences, maybe more modern ones. If you, I use this sentence from Wikipedia, it's going to tell me uh, that this is an English sentence, okay, no big deal. But also, I will get the type and the relationships of all the different items in, in the sentence, in, including the punctuation. And one thing I like very much also is that I can get the lemma, so for instance, the verb was is actually the verb to be, so I can work with the canonical form of the different items. Likewise, like with pictures, uh, it can recognize entities. Um, and so a little bit like the, the labels um, in, uh, with the pictures. So here it will map some entities to predefined classes. So in red, for instance, Tolkien is a person and as you can notice, I am getting an ID here, and it's the same ID that when I presented the Tolkien picture. Likewise, a writer, a poet, a philologist is a, a person too. British is mapped to a location, which is, which is related to the Un United Kingdom, of course. And the three books at the end of the sentence are each detected as a work of art, which is also correct. Okay, each with an ID. Likewise, the same sentence, you can cr ask for classification. And here, the model tells me that this should be classified under books and literature, and this is 97% person sure about it, which is also very correct. Okay. And last but not least, it can analyze the sentiments. So, as a demo, I tried, uh, I retrieved two reviews. Uh, from The Hobbit, an old one from back in the days uh, from the New York Times, and a recent one, which is negative, uh, from Pauline. Uh, it's a review from uh, Goodreads, which is a social network for book lovers. And the first one from The New York Times is very positive. 
So if, if I input these sentences into uh, the model, I will get results with scoring for each sentence from minus one to plus one, of course, negative and positives, and it works. So the green ones are coming from the New York Times, the negative ones are coming from Pauline, who really didn't like the book, and of course they can be neutral sentences. If you want to do that in Python, it's just a couple of lines. Of course, we are not lazy developers, but the time that we save here is time that we can have to focus on what is really important. Uh, so you create a client, you provide the content, so here it could be a movie review, and then you can call analyze sentiment and get all the positive and negative results. Okay. To give you an idea, uh, so Okado is a big uh, British retailer. Okado, they have data scientists working on innovative stuff, and um, they realized that they could use the natural uh, language API and they actually changed their customer service process for that. For, so to give you just one example, whenever they are getting one negative email, they are processing that in priority. And that's the way it works. That's the way we should process bad stuff in priority to be more reactive. If you have a very positive email, it can wait a few hours, right? So they are communicate, communicating about it. If you're interested, I gave you a link, but if you look for Ocado machine learning, you will find a few articles. Likewise, the translation API, so I won't get into the details because I'm pretty sure everyone used it somehow, so this is Google Translate, right? I will just mention one thing. Um, a few years ago, so I was not working for Google, I was just a standard user of Google Translate, and I noticed uh, someday that it was working a lot better, uh, especially for French, and so, okay, that's weird that they improved their model. But since uh, I joined Google, uh, I know I have the answer. What happened, um, in fact, is that the team switched from a statistical model to a machine learning model. And, and the bump in quality was uh, amazing. And I could just notice that as a simple user. Okay, so here in the Python sample, I have more comment lines than actual code lines. So it's just two lines. You create a client and you call translate. Okay, to give you an idea, Airbnb, they are virtually translating everything. And thanks to that, 60% of their users, uh, someone wanting to rent and someone wanting to loan, uh, uh, don't speak the same language. Thanks to that. Okay, so let's... Uh, have a demo, so you can take again the same page uh, as before. What I did is I added in my backend, Python backend, I added two calls, uh, one to the translation API, so you can ex exercise your linguistic skills. So please, you're going to try any language you'd like and try to express anything. So I will translate everything to English so that we have one common language. It could be Slovakian. Uh, and I'm going to call the natural language API on that. And to, my goal is to show you that in a few seconds, I can understand what roughly everybody is talking about and maybe take decisions. Okay, so let's move to the step two. So if you lost your page, it's bit.ly slash PyconSK19. And if you refresh the page, I think I have a bug twice again. Yeah, you can text me. So please text me anything in any language. Try to talk about something, someone famous, or anything you like or don't like. Be positive, be negative, and we, we'll check that all together. Um, okay. Okay, and I will add a few more samples in different languages. Okay. So let's see what you've been telling me. Here are the messages. Yeah, Microsoft, uh, okay. Uh, you can try, Microsoft is proposing something similar, right? Uh, arigato, is it uh, supposed to be Japanese? So here I didn't recognize it. Maybe it's not the right transliteration. 
Uh, okay, German, Lithuanian maybe, Lat uh, no, this is Latin. Uh, so it, it wasn't translated. Uh, German, Hungarian, Polish, Portuguese, Czech, I believe, French, uh, that's me, Romanian, Slovakian, okay. Okay, someone is sick and Slovakian. Okay, English, Hungarian, Finnish. Spanish, Slovakian, Chinese, so that was my sentence, Czech. Slovakian, Japanese, Slovakian, okay, German, and so on. Okay, let's check the entities. So, we've been talking about Bratislava, Syria, uh, the German language, the USA, uh, a candidate to the presidential election, machine learning, Roby, so I'm don't, I don't know what Roby is, but maybe this is the, the right entity. I can click, Slovakia, uh, lecture Bratislava Raspberry is President Watermelons. Okay. And, okay, not very interesting. And here are the different sentiments. So, of course, great tale of machine learning. So, those are the s positive sentences. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Neutral ones. I have to exterminate humanity. <laughs> Okay, uh, we could debate on that. I'm, sh I'm not sure this is neutral. So here, uh, okay, so maybe <laughs> Tulian language is not supported yet. Uh, okay, let's check the negative ones. Sunglasses, okay, you got your sunglasses. This is not my day. Oh, okay, so yeah, this is negative. Uh, not bother you anymore, okay. So I don't like watermelons. I hate watermelons, it's stronger. I like a lot. Okay, so here you see the limit. So here, uh, here this is wrong. Uh, there's, the limit is, uh, for instance, if you're using double negations, it's not clear, but it all comes to sarcasm, for instance. Even when we're using sarcasms, it's very hard. Sometimes you're confusing, you, you're taking it at the first degree when it should be second degree, right? And this is the limit with a machine learning model as of today. But the thing is that we have more context, so with more sentences, it will be more precise than that, and maybe not negative, right? But I've tested it, and the limit really is the sarcasm as of today. So, for instance, I don't dislike, I don't dislike you, what does it mean? Uh, does it mean that I love you, or does it mean that I just don't dislike you? Okay, so you, you, you can guess uh, uh, this limit. Okay, so you see, this is pretty easy. Uh, oh, I forgot to show you. So this is, uh, with the Vision API, this is the Python code that I wrote for the first function. So here I'm calling face detection and search, uh, safe search detection, so to know whether it's violent or not. I'm calling annotate image. So this is the first function, and that's it. I have the results right away. And here, this is the backend function where I'm calling translate, so into my destination language, or I'm calling uh, annotate text to to analyze the text and everything, uh, the syntax, uh, the sentiments, okay? So the cool thing is that it's easy. I can focus on the actual analysis of the results and what is important to me. Okay, let's move on. Then about speech. So speech, speech to text and text to, sh to speech are not new. Uh, you have experimented them recently in the last few years with the different assistants that you can have on your smartphones or maybe at home with Alexa, with the Google Home, with Siri on your iPhone. Uh, it works because we can now train uh, very uh, efficient uh, models and also these models are able to get rid of the noise so they, they, they have been trained on phone calls for instance and they are robust to noise. Okay. You can improve the model by providing more context if you're working in a hospital, for instance. Maybe you will give some medical terms and, and it will help the model to better detect uh, or transcribe your speech into text. Okay. Of course, if you have a, an audio stream, then you can index your stream and get all the different words with the different timestamps. There are companies using that, so they can, they can actually, like Airbnb, Azure is getting 
uh, people connected all over the world. Uh, and they are translating, but also transcribing the speech into text. Okay. So let's just try a quick demo, um, just to show you that it's also even embedded in browsers. Okay, let's try again. What is the temperature in Bratislava? It's 14 degrees in Bratislava right now. So what's in very interesting is that it's real time. Even the cloud API is real time, so you can use it. Uh, it's providing you result on the fly, so maybe not the right ones. You could see at the beginning of Bratislava, it was not Bratislava. But when it's finished, you get the optimal result. Okay. And so likewise, text-to-speech also, you can give text and generate voice. So it's not new. I've, I've, I've used that in 2001 on, on the first uh, ebook device. I was very proud. You could press play and it would read the book aloud. Nobody used my feature, <laughs> nobody, because at the time, it was a robot talking to you, right? As of today, this is a very realistic voice, and this is thanks to machine learning. Companies have been working on phonemes, half phonemes, working on trying to mimic the voice. With machine learning, we are able to do a lot better than that. That's uh, amazing. And so DeepMind, this is the, maybe you know them, they're based in London, and they, are, they were able to beat the Go uh, world champion. Uh, they are right now working on gaming, um, and they've done WaveNet. And we, with WaveNet, you can generate very uh, human-like uh, voice. And in one second, you can uh, generate 20 seconds of speech, which is amazing. One year ago, it, it was not uh, like that. Okay. Okay, I, I will move on because I have, I have only a few more minutes. So now about AutoML. So AutoML is when you're not going to be happy with the standard results from a machine learning API. With AutoML, you're going to be able to generate your own model without knowing anything in AI. So this is a new technique for about one year. Uh, and so the key here is that you have to provide the content, your own content, and then the cloud technologies will allow you to train the model automatically, deploy it, and then you will have an API exactly like the, the kind of APIs that I've been using first. Okay, so as of today, you can use AutoML Vision, so you can provide images or you can provide text, and you will, you will get, as a result, custom classifications or even a custom translation with text. So to illustrate uh, an example, with an example, I, if I take these two pictures, they are different, but they are similar. The Vision API will give me almost the same results because those are clouds in the sky, right? But if I want more specific results, I want to know if it's a Cyrus or an Alto Cumulus, then I can provide samples, a few hundreds of each type, ideally 1,000, so this is a demo made by uh, Sarah, who is a teammate in New York. So she labeled these pictures. She trained an AutoML vision model for one year first to try it. It actually takes 15 minutes because this is distributed. And then for three hours. And with th in three hours, she got a model that is uh, having a 92% precision. To evaluate the results, she, can use, she, can, she had a look at the confusion matrix, and here you can see that we can detect cumulonimbuses very well, but we are very bad at altostratuses. So it means that we don't have good altostratus features, or not enough. So this is where you know that you can, how you can improve your data set. And then, so I tried it with a picture, and this is from Poland, and it's telling me it's a cumulus. So, Let's try a demo all together. So you remember you were trying to express emotions. So if you take, again, your smartphones. So I will move back to step one with AutoML. So I train uh, an AutoML vision model with three uh, types of pictures. People yawning, okay? People sticking their tongues out, and people sleeping, okay? So if you refresh that page, now try to do one of these or Something else, okay? Oh, I can. Okay, so you can stick your tongue out to me, can try to sleep or uh, to yawn. Okay, so it has detected that my tongue is out, okay? Uh, 
Let's try to sleep. You can tweet uh, the, the picture if you, if you like. It will be related to PyCon SK. OK, I'm sleeping. OK, so let's have a quick look at your results. Tongues out. Yeah, so the tongue out is more preeminent. I could actually do a multi-class uh, training, and here it would detect both the tongue out and the, the someone sleeping. Usually, when you sleep, you don't have your tongue out, right? Um, yawning. Yes, that's correct. And sleeping. So it works. So I find that magical. Honestly, I am not an expert. I don't know anything about AI. Uh, and that's the last part. So the slides will be, are published, so I, I will give you the link. Um, and I've been able to do a model, an API, just with pictures, with a data set. I spent my time, maybe two days on the data set, in, you f in a few rounds, and I have results, uh, exceptional results. It's worked really, really well. And I use 24 hours of training, okay? If you do want to do more, so I, I'm not doing more as of today, if you want to become an expert, you can use uh, frameworks. Uh, TensorFlow is one of them. So it, it's a Python framework, a very famous one. TensorFlow will let you build a neural network on your laptop, will let you train it, for instance. At some point, you will need maybe cl the cloud to do the training in hours instead of days or weeks in the cloud. And anyway, you will have uh, the API in the cloud. Okay, TensorFlow is the, the most popular, uh, by far, um, machine learning uh, project on GitHub. There are many others, of course, you, you can have a look. Uh, here are the pointers, but the, the, the slide is public. Um, I will give you the link right after that. Okay, so the slides are here, published. Uh, please feel free to send me any feedback, uh, any question, I'm around anyway, but if later on you want to get in touch with me on GitHub, or directly on this feedback form. So thanks a lot for having me today. I hope, I hope uh, you learn a few things, uh, but ideally, I hope it gave you some ideas. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, we ran a little bit over time, so we won't have uh, as much time for discussion. There was a ton of really, really interesting questions. Um, so let's, can, let's can get started I, with a couple of them. Oh yeah, oh yeah, okay. Okay, if we can. Uh, the one with the most upvotes, is it a good idea to feed Google or Facebook or Amazon with more and more data about us? What does it mean for the society when a few companies have so much data? Yeah, this, this is a big question that I'm not able to answer in, in a few seconds here. But the thing is that you have to trust companies who, are, who have ethics. So I think um, my company or, or the company I work for uh, is one of the first to be talking about ethics. Uh, what's weird is that uh, governments should be talking about ethics first, but they are late. They're not, worth, not considering that at all. So it's, big, it's actually big companies like Google and Facebook who are maybe going to impose the real ethics that we respect. Uh, it was published last year, so the rules may be a little bit like the Asimov rules, right? What we want to do, what we don't want to do. And this is actually something that we are doing internally. We have, we have stopped a project uh, that we were doing uh, with uh, the US military. Um, and for instance, the, in the APIs, there are stuff that we don't provide. We don't allow you to recognize someone specific. We just allow you to either to do something private just for you with your private data and your private model, or we are using public, uh, public stuff uh, that you can find on the web that is really public, right? So there's no in between. Either it's private or either it's fully public. But uh, it's easier to, to have abuses from small companies, of course, we, which may sometimes are not aware of that they're doing or are not aware that they're doing something wrong, okay? Well, if you don't share, Google still knows and, um, and can be you know, mandated by the government to, to reveal that. But, but there's definitely a much bigger discussion. And uh, if someone is interested in talking yeah, more about I'm, this, it's probably better to, uh, I'm to here take if it you, off stage. You want to get in yeah. touch uh, Will there be, uh, oh, uh, does Google care or invest in AI governance? What do you think of Putin's words? The nation that leads in AI will be the ruler of the world. Yeah, yeah. So the, it's also a big question. The, actually, the mission of Google, which was written 20 years ago by the founders, 
is to make information universally accessible to everyone. So of course, for instance, uh, in some countries, the rules are different, but the core of Google is to make information accessible. And this is what we're striving for. Uh, and of course, AI is important, but also dangerous. So this is why we're talking about ethics, about rules. But I hope that governments will maybe try to work together. But anyway, at the European level, I'm pretty sure that very soon we will have laws about what you can do or not do with AI. And maybe some of them will come from Google. Uh, will there be a singularity? Why or why not? What does the huge growth of ML and, and AI mean for the humankind? I don't know. I don't know. Um, as of today, uh, the experts, they are not talking about artificial intelligence. They are talking about artificial stupidity. <laughs> we have to be realistic. We are, it's just the beginning. In a few years, we will have autonomous cars, right? We are working on it. Many companies are working on that. And that will be great because those are cars that maybe we'll be able to share uh, and not have a car for everyone. So maybe it will change for our society for the best. And of course, if you think about weapons, it could also be for the worst. And, and that's the limit, the absolute limit, I, I guess, as of today. But there could be some in-betweens that you, we should be cautious about. What are some of, some of the most fascinating and perhaps unexpected applications of machine learning that are not under NDA that you encountered? Um, wh when I have a look at what the experts are doing, uh, let's take a different example. Uh, we open, in the Paris office, we open a research center uh, for AI uh, recently. Uh, so we have a few research centers in the world and I've been able to meet people who are focusing on research and it's amazing. And one of them is working with people from hospitals and training models to detect uh, cancer tumors on pictures. And with machine, a machine learning model, actually, you are able to aggregate the knowledge of different people because some experts know how to detect this kind of tumor, but they are not able to detect other tumors because that's how they learned it. They, this is related to their own experiences. But with machine learning models and with many samples, you actually can aggregate that. So maybe what we can foresee is that AI is going to aggregate most of the human knowledge in a good way if we keep controlling that, of course. And let's pick one question that is related uh, directly to what you were talking about. Um, ML is better at recognizing pictures uh, humans recognize already. How about pictures where human brain is tricked? For example, MC Escher. Yeah, I, actually, actually it, it really works pretty much uh, like, like us. So if we are tricked by a picture, a model will also be tricked by a picture. Uh, maybe uh, if we need more time to process the picture, maybe the model will be able in less time to give the same result. But it's just a matter of training. So with the Escher pictures, of course we are tricked, those are optical illusions. But we can learn to, to detect that those are illusions. And, and likewise, a model, maybe it already exists, uh, I, I don't know, but you can teach a model to learn that, of course, also. That's all the time we have. Thank yeah, you so yeah. much, Laurent. Thank you.